Dear Professor Moodley, it is so good to be with you together with my colleague. We, are, uh, <coughs> we have been in theological training ourselves for many, many years, and we know all the tricks of the students. <laughs> if you think we don't know, it's only because we pretend not to know. But uh, no, I'm not here to, 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 to teach you, but together to sit and discuss certain things about hermeneutics. Who of you knows uh, what hermeneutics is? You know what hermeneutics is? Just put up your hands if you know what hermeneutics is. Nobody knows. <coughs> While you're in good company, I've been teaching now for hundreds of years and I still don't know what hermeneutics is. <laughs> We're here to find out. We're here to find out. And you'll get always as many answers as there are people. So why do we want to study hermeneutics? Who can tell me? Why do you want to study hermeneutics? Because it's part of the syllabus. <laughs> or what? You're laughing a lot. Tell me why do you want to study hermeneutics? What is your name? Tell us why do you want to study hermeneutics? as much as I can. <laughs> That's a very broad answer, to learn as much as I can. So instead of hermeneutics, I'm going to teach you something that may be more interesting. We'll talk about healthcare. How's that? <laughs> Who wants to study hermeneutics? Dr. Potgieter, we can go home. They don't want to study hermeneutics. Why do you want to study hermeneutics? To be more enlightened about Bible. So you, she knows that hermeneutics has something to do with the Bible. <laughs> well, he, this lady w wants to tell us, man, tell them, preach to them, tell them, speak in the mic. I want to know about human <laughs> hermeneutics, <laughs> that I may uh, understand God better. So hermeneutics is, is that subject that helps us to understand better, to interpret the Bible better. This is why you want to study hermeneutics. Because many people read the Bible and often people say, I'm not sure what I'm reading. I don't know what to, how to uh, interpret this. So this is why we have a subject like hermeneutics, to help you to interpret the Bible. But it is... It's a vast subject, so it's not possible for me just in an hour or so to, to really, you know, be able to explain to you all about hermeneutics. So what I'm going to give you today is just a little slice. We're not going to eat a whole cake, we're just going to have a little slice. And that slice must encourage you and motivate you to delve deeper into hermeneutics. Do on your own to work through the book. I don't want to repeat what is in the in the learner guide because <clears throat> that is something that you can read at home. At the end of the session today, I'll make myself together with Dr. Potgitter available for a short session. If you have any questions, we'll attempt to, to, to guide you along those lines. So <clears throat> I am giving you an overview about hermeneutics. So first of all, we need to define hermeneutics. And there are various definitions, and I always say that a student knows a subject if you're able to define it in your own words. Because to memorize something doesn't mean that you understand it. You must be able to put it in your own words. But one definition of hermeneutics, that we go to the next slide, is hermeneutics is the study of the theory and practice of interpretation. It was originally used in the study of theology and applied specifically to biblical interpretation, but has broadened since the 19th century to include philosophical theories of meaning and understanding and also theories of literary interpretation. That sounds very complicated. But what are the key words that you see there? It is about theory, number one, and two, now, it is about practice, because theory and practice will always go together. 
You can't have a practice without a theory because there's always a reason why you do a certain thing a certain way. You practice because of your theory. But if you only have a theory and you have no practice, you're not going anywhere. So you need both. And it is not only applicable to biblical interpretation. Hermeneutics can be used as a subject to interpret any literary work. The Bible is a book. <coughs> It was written by some people, put together by a reductor. So it is a guideline how to understand text, how to interpret text. We call that the subject of exegesis. Exegesis. Exegesis, you do exegesis when you are interpreting the Bible. So oftentimes a pastor may preach a sermon by using biblical text and explaining a certain narrative. We sometimes call that an expository sermon, a sermon where people have just explained the, bio, the Bible. You can go very wide and tell stories, but you can stick to the Bible and explain. And if you're interpreting the Bible, you are using the principles of hermeneutics, which is about meaning and understanding. Now, when you talk about meaning and understanding, there is always a philosophy. Philosophy is that speculation along logical lines that helps to guide our understanding. The moment you ask a question, you are practicing philosophy. So don't be afraid of philosophy. There can be a wrong philosophy. But philosophy in principle is about thinking, thinking in an ordered fashion, an ordered fashion along certain principles about the Bible. So <clears throat> let us take a philosophical approach to the Bible. <clears throat> let us ask the question, <clears throat> uh, if I read the Bible, what do I expect the Bible to teach me? What do I expect the Bible to teach me? That's a philosophical question. Because you are wondering now, you're posing a question. And there are various options to the answer. Who wants to answer that question? What do you expect from the Bible when you read the Bible? Are you expecting to learn how to, to work out the angles of a triangle or to discover the distance from the earth to the moon? If not, why do you read the Bible? Tell us, why do you read the Bible? What do you expect? Uh, you may expect to learn the moral. So the Bible tells us about God and the Bible has to work faith in your heart. When I was a pastor in my young years, I remember there was a guy that came to my church and he boasted that he was an atheist. And I said, okay, if you're an atheist, why are you coming to church? He says, no, I'm just checking. <laughs> so why are you an atheist? Because I don't have faith. I don't have faith. It's too difficult to believe in God. You tell me to believe in God, but where is God? I can't see God. Show me God. And God gave me wisdom. I said to him, sir, you know what? He was much older than me at that time. And I said, you know, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So go and read the Bible. And I challenge you today, if you read through the Bible and you still don't have faith, you come back to me and I'll apologize that I've lied to you. <laughs> so he went away and he started reading the Bible. And soon the guy had so much faith in his heart that he was converted and he became a Christian. So we read the Bible to learn about God but to have faith. Because the Bible is convincing us. When we read the Bible, the Holy Spirit enlightens our minds. So this is why we read the Bible. So we re don't read the Bible to understand how the universe came about, but that God is the creator. If I want to know how the universe go about, to what subject will I turn, do you think? So? To geography or to science or to cosmology or even to physics or to astronomy, isn't it? There are many subjects telling me how this universe came about. But the Bible also tells me about creation, but it tells me what? 
How the universe came about? No, not really. There is a story there, but it's not a scientific story. But the Bible tells me that God created. God created. That is the faith that comes in my God. When I in all some wonder, consider all the things thy hands have made, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. So when I look from a spiritual perspective to the world, I don't look at the geography or the physics. I look at, wow, this is so great and so wonderful, so intricate, that God must be very wise. So I praise God. That is the scope of the Bible. So it means that this is the first principle of hermeneutics. That when we go to the Bible, we should know what to expect. If we expect to learn a scientific lesson, we are asking the Bible questions that the Bible does not want to answer. And you know, many people do that. Many people do that. I saw a pamphlet the other day at friends of mine's house, and the title of the pamphlet, what does the Bible tell you about smoking? Who of you are smokers? Don't put up your hands. <laughs> you may feel guilty. What does the Bible tell you about smoking? Who can tell me what the Bible tells you about smoking? Nobody, because the Bible says nothing about smoking. Did you ever read in the Bible about smoking? The Bible tells us that we should be free and we should not be addicted. Yeah, if you see it in that sense, then maybe it's bad to smoke. But the Bible doesn't tell you not to smoke. God doesn't even tell that to you. You must tell it to yourself. If you tell something to yourself, you will believe it. If somebody else tells you something, you know, it's second-hand knowledge. Uh, God's telling me not to smoke. Yes, I am. I hate it when God tells me that because I like to smoke. That's not good religion. But if I can say, man, I'm not smoking because it's bad for my body. I'm defiling my lungs. I'm, I don't want to die at the age of 35 of cancer. Do you know it with smoking? So what do we expect God to tell us or the Bible to tell us? I think that guy that wrote that pamphlet, what the Bible says about smoking, he must be very clever. Because he saw some text in the Bible that I've never seen. So that is hermeneutics. Knowing what to expect of the Bible. So it is not wrong if I say to you, no, you know it is a bad habit to smoke. And the Bible tells us we should be free and not slaves then it's good hermeneutics. But I can't tell you the Bible says don't smoke. Okay. Who is not agreeing with me? You're happy so far. So that, now we have a basic idea of what hermeneutics is all about. Knowing what to expect from the Bible. Knowing what God is telling and not telling us. There is also a second definition. Hermeneutics is a study of the theory and practice of interpretation. It was originally used in the Bible. Uh, no, this one we've already, already got. There's the next one. The study of the general principles of biblical interpretation for both Jews and Christians throughout their history is the primary purpose of hermeneutics. There's a key word. The primary purpose. Okay, of hermeneutics. And of exegetical methods. Do you still know, uh, remember what exegesis is all about? Exegesis, interpreting the Bible, employed in interpretation has been to discover the truth and the values of the Bible. To discover the truth and the values of the Bible. So the Bible is a source of information about things that have to do with religion, and by using inter in hermeneutics, we can get a better understanding of what it is all about that the Bible tells us. And otherwise, it, is no, it makes no sense to read the Bible. So I always like, when I lecture, to compile a mind map. And the mind map, you start by putting down all the different keywords and then group them together. 
So when I think about hermeneutics, there are four major things that I need to consider. The first one is the Bible, because that is the purpose of studying hermeneutics. I want to interpret the Bible. The second thing is the church or denomination or religious grouping that I belong to, because that is the place where we study the Bible, and those, those people, they influence me. In the third instance, there's me. Let me call myself the exegete, the person that is now studying to interpret the Bible, the Bible expositor. And then there is the philosophy, which is always important, because the philosophies, the conceptual schemes, the frameworks, all those things will influence me. So under Bible, we have commentaries. What are commentaries? Those are books that describe to us the content of the Bible. So um, there are many people, scholars, who made painstaking research into certain biblical texts. For instance, you've been doing, I understand, Greek this morning. We also do Aramaic languages and Hebrew and so on. So, for instance, the Bible says that the spirit that lives in me is crying, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. In Afrikaans, there's a word, Abba, which means like carrying on my back. If I carry something on my back, I am abbaing that person. So I heard the preacher preaching. He says, you know, God is so kind. He, the Spirit calls Abba Father. In other words, Father, take me and carry me on your back. Why are you laughing now? <laughs> is that wrong? What does the word Abba mean? Who knows? Father. So if the Spirit is calling Abba Father, he's simply saying, Father or my Papa. It's a personal thing. Papa, Abba Father. So, you know, if we don't understand the languages, if we don't practice good hermeneutics, we'll end up saying silly things. So, therefore, we can read the commentaries, get the good commentaries. There are many good commentaries that you can purchase. The ancient languages, we need to be able to use these languages. You remember the, pa the passage where Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord Jesus, I love you. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. The third time Jesus says, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Why is Jesus asking repetitively, Peter, do you love me, love me, love me? If we read that in the English or Afrikaans or whatever Bible, we won't understand unless we look to the original languages. Because in the Greek language, Jesus is saying, Peter, agapau. Do you love me with a divine love? And Peter is replying and saying, Lord, I love you with a filial love. In, Bible, in the English it's just translated love, love, love. But Jesus is not satisfied. Are you loving me with agape love, divine love? Yes, Lord, I love you with filial love as a brother. So that's why Jesus is, is repeating himself. So this is why we need the languages. There are dictionaries that can explain to us certain words in the Bible. And there's the context of the Bible in which we must read it. We now said the scope of the Bible, it's not a scientific book. It's, it's not a book about social science, whatever. It's a book about religion or about faith. And there's the inspiration of the Bible. The whole Bible is breathed by God. Neufnestos, the Greek word meaning God breathed the Bible. He did not dictate to these people what to write because if you read the Bible, you'll find that Paul has his own use of phraseology and vocabulary and is different from that of the other Bible writers. But in any case, they wrote inspired by the Holy Spirit to present the truth. Then <coughs> there is the church. The hermeneutics that you and I will practice will depend on the church in which we live. Because the church has an identity. The church has a certain training program. The church has a certain confession or creed. The Apostles' Creed, for instance, to, to formalize what we believe. It has a certain tradition. It has a certain dogma or theology. There's even a certain sentiment and tradition in the church. 
It could be an evangelical church, a charismatic or Pentecostal or reformed church. They will all differ with regards to the way they understand religion. We can't say the one is wrong and the other one is right because they all appeal to different peoples with different needs and so on. And they have different theologians influencing them. So that will be taken into consideration. Then is the exegete, which has a certain insight. Not all people have the same insight or conceptual scheme or level of development. Not all people have the same spiritual sensitivity because we believe that the Holy Spirit will lead us as we study the Bible. And not all people have the same kind of dedication. So there are many variables that will play a role. So what we're saying is, you know, it's not just an academic discipline. To understand the Bible is something that you must personally experience. And it must be true in your own life. Then it becomes convincing. And it must be something that you pray about and that you trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. And in your specific situation, He will speak to you the truth of God. That is the Rima word, the, the live word, a, a word that addresses you. So we're not talking here about discovering universal truths that will be generally applicable to all people always, and that is why people will differ. And so it is important to know that there's always this personal issue in hermeneutics. There are certain principles here that we can apply, but in the end it becomes a personal issue because it is the way you are addressed by God and the responsibility that comes with that. And then in the fourth instance there is the philosophy. We will look just now at a few philosophers through the ages who have really influenced our thinking and we may not even be aware of them because we take it for granted that this is the way the world works. But it's not true. The way the world works is explained to us from school days by the influence of these philosophers. And there are certain world views that we as people in the Western world subscribe to that may not be applicable or even make sense to people in other cultures. So the cultural issue is definitely, uh, definitely also uh, a factor. And then also different paradigms. Uh, in, in, in the days of, 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 of ancient um, Egypt, you know that there was the worldview of Ptolemy who believed that the earth was the center of the universe. And then when the first people discovered uh, telescopes and they start looking at the celestial bodies like Copernicus and, and Galilee and those people, they started saying to the church, hey, you know what? We see that the sun is not moving. It is all the planets moving around the sun. And the sun is really at the center of the solar system. And the church got very cross and said, how can you say that? You know? The earth must be the center because it's so important that Jesus came to this earth to die. It is the, the very center of all things. And they even wanted to burn those people on the stake. But now today we know that the church was wrong. And the scientists were right. But the hermeneutics of the church tricked them. It said to them, you know, if Jesus came to die on the cross, then the earth must be at the center of it all. But the earth is at the center of God's importance, but not at the center of the astronomy. So those things are things that we must be aware of. Otherwise, we land ourselves in a situation where we become embarrassed. So <coughs> then also the scope of hermeneutics. Let's go to the next slide. And there we see that... Um, uh, we again at the first slide. Okay, who wants to repeat it all? Let me see. <laughs> Let's rather move on. Scope. <clears throat> there is Friedrich Schleiermacher. We talked about the philosophers that influenced our thinking. And Schleiermacher, along with Wilhelm Dilti, considered understanding to be a process of psychological reconstruction. That is to say the reconstruction by the reader of the original intention of the author. So remember, those things that we read in the Bible, when were they written? How many years ago? Thousands of years ago, okay. 
And you know that not even the original manuscripts are really available. We only have copies of copies of copies. So that makes it very, very difficult. But nevertheless, there is the, that is not robbing us of the, of the truth of the, or the veracity of what the Bible tells us because there is the personal sense that we talked about that we must be able to experience for ourselves what those people experience. They are telling to us to inspire faith so that we may have the same experience. If we only comprehend it in a rational sense, it's not going to meet its mark because the purpose of the Bible is to inspire faith. And that is why people like Schleiermacher and those people emphasize the personal, the psychological reconstruction, putting myself in the shoes of the author, which is not always easy to do, but that is one way of going about it. So when we go to the next slide, where does the concept hermeneutics come from? It comes from Greek mythology, the word hermeneutics, because Hermes was the messenger of the gods of the ancient Greeks. They sent Hermes with messages. The gods sent Hermes to come to tell us certain things. And of course, that's a myth. But that whole idea of a messenger became the principle of hermeneutics sending a message. Because when we read the Bible, there is the revelation of God. Why is there revelation? Because those things that come through revelation are the things that we would otherwise not have known unless God reveals it to us. Isn't it true? So that to me is also a very important hermeneutical principle and that is that God never takes us to heaven to tell us things there. He comes to us in our language, even in our human form, to explain to us. Because otherwise we won't be able to understand it. So that is the revelation, the message of God. The Bible is the revelation of God. God telling us about himself. That he is love and that he cares for us and that he has a plan and purpose with us and with this world. Okay, so... The, if we go to the next slide, we can sort of summarize it now all by looking at the complexity of hermeneutical understanding. <coughs> I know that many people think that they start with the Bible. So we start with the Bible. I had one friend who says, you know, I don't preach sermons because if I preach sermons, I preach human thoughts. I just preach the Bible. I quote the Bible. Is that possible? No, it is not, because even the text that you select means you select it with a certain understanding to convey a certain message. So we don't start with the Bible, because there's no blank up here that needs to be filled with the Bible. I come to the Bible already with ideas, with presuppositions, with belief systems, and so on. So that is like glasses that you wear. If you put on glasses with a pink tint, the whole world will look pinkish. If you put on a blue tint, it will look blue. Right? So we come and we have glasses on, and that is why, how we look at the Bible. Those glasses are given to us by the church, by the philosophers, and so on and so on. And it is not wrong, but we should be aware of it. And that is on the left-hand side, that I call the presuppositions that we sit with. The presuppositions. Those things that we believe. Yes, lady. Now, remember I said hermeneutics does not only have to do with the Bible. It has to do with the meaning interpretation of any book or anything that you want to understand. It's only the word hermeneutics that derives from Hermes, which was a Greek messenger. And many words that we have come from Greek. Even all the Latin words come from Latin and so on, that we use for, for, for scientific terms and so on. So we've borrowed it. It doesn't mean that the mythology has to do with the Bible. The, the mythology was the Greeks' way in ancient days to explain the world. 
because they did not have the Bible. So we enter the Bible with presuppositions. And it's not wrong because we cannot rid ourselves from presuppositions, but we can critically assess our presuppositions and know that they can change from time to time. Then we go to the Bible, and when we go to the Bible, we go with our hermeneutical understanding, the academic discipline of hermeneutics, saying, you know, this is a principle that we need to apply when we read the Bible. And of course, also doing it prayerfully because we need to trust on the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it only becomes a rational explanation. It must be also on a personal level. If, if your understanding of the Bible cannot transform you and bring progress in your sanctification, then it means nothing. Why we always say that real knowledge is transformation. But unfortunately, often in churches, people think that the doctrine or the creed or the confession, that is the truth. What is the truth, the real truth? It's not propositions. It's not the things that we write down. What is the real truth? Who can tell me? Who said, I am the truth? Jesus himself. Jesus himself. So in that sense, what is the meaning of truth? If Jesus said, I am the truth, what does he mean? What does he trying to tell us? Sorry? It's, yeah, it, it's, yeah, that is where we are. There's no other truth. This is the truth. If, if there's something else in conflict with this, then it is a lie. It's false. But what is the philosophical meaning of truth? Why do we want to know the truth? Because the truth links us with reality. What is ultimate reality? God. If you're sitting here and you're blind and you, you're asking me, Explain to me how this place looks like. And I say, you know what? <clears throat> there are some blue curtains in front of the windows and there is a, a pulpit in front that is transparent and so on. If you walk to this pulpit and you want to touch it, you must be able to feel it is there. Then you know that I've been telling you the truth because your, my truth is corresponding with reality. Jesus said, I am the truth, which means that he is now telling us about God, the Father, the ultimate reality. We can trust in Jesus, in that truth, because he is now telling us that what he's telling us is really what we will find when we meet God. If he says God is love, he's not lying. He cannot tell us God is love and we find out that God is hatred. He is telling us the truth. So this is what the function of truth is, is to convey reality. So hermeneutics is just a principle of coming to grips with truth, but truth must also have meaning and understanding. Otherwise, it's just information. And you know the day and age that we live in, the computer day and age, is all about information. But information does not always have meaning or truth content. It's not life transforming. It is of technological value and, and, and financial value, but it's not really shaping us. The truth that we're talking about is that truth that transforms us because it introduces us to a kind of reality that shapes our very being. And then the output, the output or the outcomes is that effect of the transformation that took place. What is the transformation that God requires? That we should become his disciples. That we should become holy. So if those outcomes are not there, then there is no truth. Because truth will always transform us due to the fact that it brings that reality into my life that can shape my life. Okay. So this is why it is so important to understand 
what is the problem around hermeneutics. We go to the next slide and we talk about the hermeneutical circle. The hermeneutical circle. What is the grounds for our judgment? You know? It's like the lady that, um, that uh, the, 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 the pastor was preaching and he was saying, you know, the earth is suspended in space. It's just hanging there in space, kept in space by gravitational forces and movement. And an elderly lady confronted the pastor afterwards and saying, you know what, <clears throat> you said that the earth is suspended, but you, we read in the book of Job that the earth is, is, is really established on the foundations that God put there. And he said, but what are those foundations, lady? What do you expect is keeping the earth in place? He says, no, I think it's a very large tortoise. It's a very great skillpad. And he says, okay, and what is keeping that tortoise in place? She says, another bigger tortoise. He says, and that tortoise is he suspended in mid -air. She says, no, pastor, man, don't be stupid. It is tortoises all the way down. <laughs> So that is the hermeneutical circle that people will challenge you and say, how do you know that the truth that you subscribe to, the things that you believe that it is true? And, you know, to say it's a tortoise, then you'll have to find another tortoise on which to put that tortoise and so on and so on. So this is what brings us to the place that we will say, in the end, the only thing is, that uh, there is transformation that takes place. That that reality that we discover is true to us. We were talking in the car when we came, Dr. Potgitter told me about uh, a missionary many years ago that was challenged to go into the missionary field to preach to the, to the Muslims. And he knew, you know, that he wasn't able to persuade them on intellectual claims and so on. So he was challenged to, in front of a Muslim congregation, to say, people, if God is the real living God, then God is going to heal people here today. And I want you to come. Let me pray for you to see if God can heal you, if he's alive. So somewhere there must be that challenge to say, you know, the truth, it transforms. The truth, it delivers. The truth, it is there. It's not just a story. It's not just a story that we tell him. That is where we end the hermeneutical circle, okay? So, okay, let's look at a few different approaches. There are traditional schools of, of, um, of interpretation. There is that of St. Jerome that <coughs> uh, started the literal approach to the Bible, where people say, you know, what I read is what I believe. And that sounds very good. If I say from the pulpit, Brothers and sisters, we must trust that what we believe in the word of God is the truth. You know what will happen? All people will say, Amen. <laughs> but it's not so easy. Why is it not so easy? Because there are many things, figurative speaking in the Bible, that we cannot take literally. And we, we need to know which things to take in literal sense and which things not. Like, let's take one example. We know that the Bible says, Paul says, you know, if a lady goes to church, she must wear a hat. Is it true? The Bible says so. Because it's a sign of accepting authority. But now, today, in many churches, you will find that almost nobody wears a hat any longer. And some people will challenge you on that and say, hey, you're not true to the Bible. The Bible very literally says you must wear a covering on your head. But then these people who are knowledgeable in hermeneutics came to us and said to us, but wait a minute, in the patriarchal days when the Bible came about, that was a sign of authority. But in today's world, wearing a hat is no longer a sign of authority. So we can't just simply take 
all those customs that were applicable in those days and apply them today, then it's silly. It doesn't make sense. So that is why many churches today don't oblige their women to wear hats. They're not going against the Bible. They just understood, you know, you can't take that custom that Paul referred to that he made a spiritual principle out of and apply it in a general and universal sense. So this is where hermeneutics come in. If you don't have hermeneutics, you will find it difficult to understand. Okay. That exactly explains to us the complexity of it all. It's not just a matter of having a biblical text, one or two texts, to, because you can have a text for ever, anything in, in life. So it is really, you remember we, we said, and that was a fairly complex picture that I had up there. There's the church, there's the philosophy, there is the Irish bird, there is the whatever, whatever. All those things will co-determine in the end our conclusions that we make. So it's just not a matter of selecting here or selecting there what suits us. It's really an earnest way to apply hermeneutics to come to grips with what is applicable to us today. Because the Bible is an ancient book. And there are many customs in those days that we don't apply today because we're living in a different social setting and so on. So hermeneutics is also spanning that gap between the social customs of those days and what we have today. So in the end, we need to, in a very responsible way, interpret the eternal truth of God that Jesus saves, but make it applicable today. If we don't that, do that, then we will lose people because what we preach won't make sense to people. And it's not an easy task. But if I go from here today and at least you, you go home and you, and, you, and you understand and say, gee, you know what? I saw that if I come to class, I will find an easy recipe that I can apply to understand the Bible. But now I go home and I understand it's much more complex than I thought it was. Then I would have succeeded in my goal. It sounds crazy, but it is true. And so, let's go to the next slide. <coughs> Sorry, let, let's just go to the previous slide again. We missed that one. We talked about <coughs> different approaches to the Bible. The one guy approaches the Bible in a literal sense, at face value. And that is the literal approach. Then there's also the moral approach, where the guy says, no, it's not important exactly what the, what the, what the text says, what is important is the inspiration to live a moral and ethical, responsible life. Then there's a third meaning that's allegorical. Many of the church fathers use that. Allegorical means just to say, let us learn lessons from the Bible. You know, Let us see what lessons we can use. That These uh, things that we read in the Bible are just types, typological, giving us examples of how we should live. And then there's a fourth anagogical way which says, no, not at all. It's about a mystical interpretation. So we don't have to go into depth with, uh, with regards to all these schools, but just to make you understand that there are various approaches to the Bible. Let me give you an example again. Um, <clears throat> let us take uh, the eschatology, the, what we call the end times end times. In many evangelical churches they believe that the Bible says that Jesus will come back to earth to reign for a thousand years. There will be a thousand years of peace, the so-called millennium. And after that time, the great judgment will take place and the new heaven and new earth will come about. So those people believe, believing that are called millennialists. And they have their texts Revelation 20 and many other texts that they quote. Because they follow a rather literal understanding of what the Bible says. 
Then there are other, other Reformed churches who are also serious about understanding the Bible and also dedicated Christians. And they say, you know what? The thousand years that the Bible talks about. Yes, it talks about a thousand years. But it is just about a perfect period of peace that was inaugurated at the cross of Jesus. So we're now living, it's been 2,000 years already, but I say it's just a perfect period. 1,000 is a symbolic number to say that there will be a perfect time because since the, the death of Jesus, Satan was bound and now we have peace until that time that Jesus comes. So they, the so-called amillennialists, they don't believe in literal uh, millennium because the one reads the Bible literally and the other one not. So who can say who is right and who is wrong? We've been fighting about that for many years. But I think that we can approach this with respect and understanding once we realize, look, there are people doing a literal understanding and there are others who take the Bible figuratively. And it's all about hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is going to tell you how to understand the Bible, but it's not going always to tell you which one is the correct understanding. That will be determined by your church and your belief systems and many other things. Okay. So I hope that doesn't sound too confusing, but at least to come to grips with the complexity of the situation is what is important. Otherwise, you go naively through the world as a pastor and not be able to come to grips with it all. But let us uh, take a five-minute break, and when we come back, we'll wrap it up.